Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. St. Paul writes to his listeners, St. Paul and Gary Paul, that's my middle name. I want you to forget that now. Says to you, I thank God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good, he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's soothing, isn't it? And it's comforting. And it's a far cry from what Saint, from what John the Baptist said out in the desert near the banks. He said, you brood of vipers. You brood of vipers. He called God's people. The message is, is kind of a picture, a portrait, a painting in contrast between what we usually think of God's message for us, grace and peace, and, and what the Baptist said to the people. Let's start from the beginning. John the Baptist was, uh, the contrast, we're going to start with the Baptist and we're going to do Pastor Gary. John the Baptist looked weird. He was an odd character. He didn't live in town, not that other people, all people live in town. But he lived out under the stars in the desert. And he dressed in a weird way. He had uh, animal skin for his clothes. Probably was bare or sandals. I don't think there was any public um, plumbing out in the desert. So he might have had kind of a body smell to him. And when he... When he, um, we'll talk about his preaching style in a moment. Okay, so that's one. Now, I'm not the best looking thing in the world, but I did take a shower last night. Hmm? And I tried to look pastoral, you know, professional, like, like uh, maybe the way God would want me to look in my public ministry. Hmm? I kind of wear ordinary clothes, try to wear a collared shirt all the time, a tie when it's appropriate, maybe a clerical collar and things like that. I live in a nice place. If you come over, you won't be sitting among the saguaro. You'll be in a place that has a roof and walls, air conditioning in the summer, heat in the winter. A kind of an ordinary person, but John the Baptist was different. The next thing that goes on about him was their reputation. John the Baptist, when he preached, as the text says, people came from everywhere to hear him preach. He had a fine reputation for drawing crowds. I've been here six weeks and have yet to get 100 people in the church. I don't hear a lot of people, or I don't see a lot of people, like at Starbucks, early on Sunday morning, lined up to come into church. There's, and I doubt if you've heard the fact that, oh, Pastor Gary, that new pastor you got, I hear he's a dynamic speaker. We'll see you at church. I don't think you're saying that, and if they heard it, they probably would just go, so what? Okay, Quite a contrast between the Baptist and the prophet that stands before you now. John the Baptist, when he preached, raised his voice. He thundered his message. He was loud and shouted. Today, if you do that, people will turn you off. Or you'll turn people off. They like to be talked in a soothing way. If you talk about their sins, they don't want you to beat. They don't want to beat over the head about it. Just tell us about our sins. And John the Baptist, if he had a doctrine that he knew was true and was God's message for you, he would say it whether you appreciated his opinion or not. That's a little bit about his audience. Today's audience, a person might come to any kind of a speaker, a preacher, a politician, whatever, they might just say to you, well, that's your opinion, I have mine. 
So John the Baptist was staunch and had a backbone of spine. And he thundered his message. And he had a great reputation for speaking. And he drew crowds. And today's modern pastors, you know, sometimes we struggle. Even though we have the same word of God. And then there's the content of the Baptist message and the content of the prophets who stand in front of you. The Baptist content was not grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God every time I remember you. I say something like that almost every time I'm in the pulpit. And I try to bring you law, yes, but I don't dwell on it. You're a sinner, you know that, let's be reminded of that, let's repent, and then let's get to the good stuff, God's forgiveness for our sins. The Baptist was in un unique in that he spoke judgment on people and he stayed there. He stayed there. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, not grace and mercy, not dear friends in Christ, not brothers and sisters, but get this, you brood of vipers. How'd you like that if I said that this morning? You jerks, you lowlifes. That's kind of what the Baptist said. And that's judgment. And he tarried on that. He said, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? The coming wrath, that's law. God's going, to, God's going to deal with sin and those who participate in sin. And then he said this, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. So he calls for repentance just the way a modern day prophet does, but he adds something to it. He says, produce fruit of repentance. The ax is already at the root of the trees. That's kind of scary. And every tree you, me, that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. The people didn't spin around and flee the outdoor congregation at that time. They were man enough to listen to the message that repentance should be taken seriously. And I think this morning's message is not that we don't repent, not that we don't know what repentance is, not that we don't know God loathes sin, but we, take, we don't take repentance seriously, and therefore we don't appreciate absolution seriously. The people asked, what should we do then? What should we do then? And the answer is, the biblical answer in the biblical terms is fruit. Is fruit. You need to produce something. You need to not, and me too. You see me on my knees up there on your behalf? Gary's saying, oh, I, I'm sorry for my sins. And, and then I get up and I forgive myself and I forgive you. Uh-uh, uh-uh. The Baptist reminds us that there's a link missing, that repentance is not just a verbal thing, but it's an action thing, fruit. We need to produce fruit. The New Testament word for repentance is metanoia. Uh, Nathan, would you come help me with a very simple, non-harmful demonstration? Okay. It's an action thing. So you're going through life. If you'd walk slowly towards the Christmas tree, Nathan's going slowly through life, and he has this bad habit of talking back to his parents. Do you have that bad habit? Good, all right. But let's say he did, and he comes to church on Sunday, and life is kind of going the same, but he has this bad habit. I have a bad habit. I have several bad habits. They're not habits. They're sins, and I kind of like them, and you kind of like yours. But you keep walking through life, and you come, and you repent of your sins. Good. All right, and God says it's not just saying you're sorry, but it's metanoia. It's a change of mind which recreates a change of action. So repentance isn't just what Nathan did, walking and saying you're sorry. It's a turning around. Now you walk that way. 
And as he walks this way, having taken repentance seriously, he appreciates the grace of God and he no longer talks back to his parents, or at least he works on it. Thank you, thank you. I know you're a good kid. You've got other bad habits maybe, but that's good you don't have that one. That's why the Baptist calls us brood of vipers. Hmm. That's why the Baptist says, who told you, uh, who told you to flee the day of wrath? God is expensive, very expensive. So expensive that when we repent and get absolution, and you will, I'll always do it. And it might be kind of matter of fact, but it's real and it works, that we should invest a change of behavior. Get it? Real sacrificial grace requires real sacrificial repentance. And it's set at this time of year because on the 25th of December, 24th of December, we welcome the, the expensive gift of God's grace in, in the life and death of his son. So I like to give homework. I want, seriously, teachers, got your assignment book? Kids? Cell phone, <laughs> okay. I want you to th think over your life. Hey, th let me do this. This is what Luther does. He says, how do I find out what my sins are? How do I find out what my sins are? I'm not a tax collector, so I don't charge double. You know, he gave that example. Yeah, I have two coats. Maybe I could give a coat. But Luther makes it really modern. He says, what sins are these which we should confess? Consider your place commandments. Are you a father? Yes. Mother? Yes. Son? Yes. Daughter? Yes. Okay. Husband? Some. Wives? Some. Right. Worker? Have a job? Have an employer? Okay. Consider your station in life. Have you been disobedient? Talk back to mom and dad. Talk back to your boss. Snarly with your wife. Don't look at me that way. All right. Lazy. Yes, 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 and yes. Okay. Have you been hot-tempered? Hmm? Don't have to give me all the gory details. Inventory. Okay. Rude, oh, that's one of my biggest problems, rude, impatient, impatient. My wife says I'm impatient. <laughs> I go Quarrelsome, that happens in the church. You're a church member and you're fighting with each other. I want it my way. You're fighting with each other. Right? We never did it that way before. That's happened the six weeks I've been here. Never did it that way before. Okay, you find yourself in, in your daily life. In your daily life, find out what needs repentance and metanoia. Have you hurt someone by your words or deeds? Yes, all week long, right? Me. Deeds, have you stolen? Do you take a paycheck without working for it? Do you cheat on tests? No. Other kids do, though. That's stealing. Okay. Wasted anything? Time? Food? I'm a real bugger about wasting food. I was just conditioned that way. I think it's wrong. It is wrong. Wasting your time or done any harm. So find in your daily routine, this is your homework, in your daily routine, of which Sunday is a part, and find out what needs, not just lip service. Just do one, just do one. I have a list of about 120. I'm going to do just one. Hmm? And I'm going to be serious about it because I don't like being called a brood of vipers. Hmm? And I want to appreciate Christ, God's gift in Jesus, which we celebrate his grace, which will forgive that sin, will forgive that sin. But I don't want to make his grace cheap. And so I'm going to pick one, and so are you, in your daily walk, whatever it is. You don't have to tell anybody. You don't have to tell anybody. You just tell yourself. You just tell yourself, and you repent it to God, and your repentance includes leaving it behind. 
all the way. I don't want no 90 degrees. I don't want this. I don't want 75 degrees. I want to turn about 180 degrees. So you leave by behind the rudeness, the snarliness, the quarrelsomeness, whatever it is, whatever it is. Maybe looking at stuff you shouldn't look at. Maybe tight with the dog, whatever it is. You do that one and you leave it behind. Because repentance, because grace calls for genuine, action-oriented repentance. Thanks be to God who gives us grace to cover that sin, sin, all of our sins. Let's do it this Advent. This Advent, just this, this Advent. Don't worry about Epiphany. Don't worry about New Year's resolutions. Don't worry about doing this next year. But on this Sunday, one. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting.